Hi, here's something I bet you didn't know. The humble frequency counter here can actually change frequency depending upon its orientation. Don't believe me? Let me show you. I've got my Agilent uh, 53131A frequency counter here, an excellent frequency counter. It's got a built-in uh, high-stability ovenized uh, reference oscillator, and it's measuring uh, the 10 megahertz reference frequency from my external uh, CSIRO Rubidium frequency standard here. Watch what happens if I just increase the tilting bail, uh, put the tilting bail up. Look at that. It's changed. Magic. It's changed by uh, three millihertz there. If I put it back, it's changed back to exactly where it was before. Why is it so? Well, the reason for this is that the internal uh, quartz crystal oscillator in this thing, be it an ovenized one like this, which is kept at a stable temperature, or be it the uh, generic internal one that you're uh, familiar with, with using as you know, your 10 megahertz reference oscillator on your microcontroller, for example, they're all quartz crystal oscillators and they're susceptible to many different forms of uh, environmental uh, things. Like, for example, everyone knows this, uh, uh, they change with temperature. Of course, they'll have a certain temperature spec, they'll drift with temperature, they have an aging characteristic, so every year they'll age by a certain amount, and they have voltage dependency, all sorts of things, and not only that, but also uh, physical shock and vibration as well. Now, as it turns out, I've actually done some research on this at a former company I used to work for, and you can actually reset the drift characteristics of a typical quartz crystal oscillator by impacting it with a certain shock or vibration. So what's going on here actually has nothing to do with uh, shock or vibration or temperature thermal gradients inside the other or anything like that. What it is, is uh, related to the shock and vibration in that the physical crystal inside vibrates and that is actually susceptible to gravity. Believe it or not, yes, gravity, you can't escape it. You can actually use your frequency counter to detect gravity. And by physically changing it like that, you're actually changing the vibration characteristics of the crystal because you're changing its orientation relative uh, to the gravitational field. So if I turn it over like that, for example, we will see it change yet again. And look at this, you'll notice that it's changed by roughly uh, 4 millihertz there. If I turn it all the way over, it should double. That difference should double. And yeah, it pretty much does. So it went from uh, 4 millihertz above to basically 4 millihertz below or thereabouts because we don't have the resolution. We'd have to go to a greater uh, gate time there to uh, get better resolution. But you can see that we can actually detect gravity because when you turn a crystal upside down you're changing its physical vibration properties relative to that gravitational field so when you actually calibrate instruments like this you've actually got to calibrate them in a specific orientation and just changing that tilting bail like that you think nothing of it but you could do that and if you're talking about serious measurement look I mean, we're easily, we can get this frequency counter to go to another digit resolution after this, but that's the sort of impact you can, that gravitational fields can have on quartz crystals. Who knew? And it turns out that your average uh, quartz crystal has a, a gravitational change of roughly uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 9 per G. So uh, that translates to, on a 10 megahertz uh, signal, a 10 megahertz crystal like this, uh, 0.01 hertz basically per G. So take your humble quartz crystal here and let's crack this thing open and actually see what's inside this thing. And after you carefully slice one open, Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. And that is what's inside your typical quartz crystal that you're used to using. There's a, a big circular slither of quartz there with a couple of electrodes on either side. And that thing vibrates and that's how crystal oscillators actually work. But as you can see by the orientation of that, if you orient it in that direction, gravity is going to have a different effect than if you orientate it in that direction, as very minor as that is, as very small as that gravitational effect is, it does actually make a difference. 
Now, you might be a bit puzzled as to what's actually going on here. Why does it make a difference if we suddenly, like, flip this axis of the crystal over like this, i.e. we go like that and we turn it over, or whichever way you want to uh, do it. Isn't the force of gravity down towards the center of the Earth, for example, like 1G, it's still 1G pointing down on the crystal. Why does that make a difference? Well, you've got to remember that the uh, crystal was measured, i.e., you know, calibrated, because this is a frequency, it's a reference, for example, uh, then that was actually calibrated with it in this orientation, with 1G being applied to, say, this top surface here. So if you've got positive 1G coming down on this top surface, and when you flip it over like this, it was one frequency in that respect before, but now you've got one positive 1G on this surface, so you've effectively got negative 1G reference from the other side, so that's why you get a total difference figure, a total frequency change of 2G when you flip it over, and hence why this phenomenon is called 2G tip over and it's a very common thing you flip a crystal over like this on a bench and you get a difference of 2g now as i said it does change with the cut what's called the cut of the crystal as well and a typical uh, sc cut crystal is as i have said uh you know roughly uh one times ten to the minus nine or one part per billion but your say your at cut crystals they can be like an order of magnitude worse than that now what we've actually seen here is very low values of G. We're just basically changing the orientation like that. So it changes by 2G when you flip it over, which is basically uh, nothing, really. The real problem with these things comes about when you start to move them, i.e. you're up in a plane or something like that, or you're some other thing which is moving, accelerating all over the place. Well, you can have really big problems with uh, stability of your oscillator. So it's a really huge deal. Now, you might be wondering, does this 2G tip-over effect apply to atomic frequency standards like this rubidium uh, frequency standard I've got here? Uh, does it have that same 2G tip-over problem? Because if you know the uh, block diagram of how a rubidium frequency standard works, it basically has a regular quartz crystal in there, which is then frequency locked to the atomic um, physics package inside there. So 2G tip-over will apply, of course, to the quartz crystal inside this thing, but because it's with inside a servo loop locked to the uh, atomic rubidium frequency physics package inside there, then it the frequency will change. The output of the rubidium standard will change, but it uh, its frequency will be dependent upon how fast the servo loop can act and actually correct for that change. And there are other physical effects, like uh, if you that's if you just rotated the crystal inside there. But of course, if you if rotated this entire package, then the rubidium standard itself uh, the actual rubidium inside the uh, element in there can uh, diffuse in a different way and you can get physical effects that way. Um, but it's not the same 2G tip over effect that you get in the quartz crystals. So it can affect it. So certainly if you were, you know, if you're in a calibration standard lab and you had an, a rubidium frequency standard like this, you wouldn't be going tipping the thing over, that's for sure. But really, it's not something you really have to worry about unless you're absolutely critical uh, talking about your rubidium uh, standards there. Certainly not in the same league as what we see here with our uh, quartz crystal ovenized oscillator. Not even close. These things, yeah, you can just measure it on your basic frequency counter. And there is plenty of great research out here on this, and it, it does make fascinating bedtime reading if you're interested in this sort of thing. So I hope you found that interesting, and you've gained a new appreciation for what happens when you tilt your tilting bale like that. A little insignificant change to your instrument can have a significant impact upon your measurements, can even change the calibration of your instrument. There you go. Fascinating, but true, and it can be a really big deal in uh, some applications. As I said, when things start moving, we've just got a basic frequency counter on the bench here, and we can measure it easily. We can even measure it with more precision than this if we really want to. So there you go. Hope you found that interesting. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.